Okay, great, everyone. We'll uh, get started. Thank you for uh, being here. Um, we've uh, this is the third in our series of uh, presentations that we call our Ag Education Program, and uh, I think many of you have been to the previous two. And and we're trying to uh, kind of do topics that are that are quite varied, keep you interested, and and also to I think illustrate. Uh, that uh, agriculture as an industry is varied in and of itself. So um, we have here today Scott Deerdorf from Deerdorf Family Farms and uh, is going to talk about their operation. Been here uh, in, in uh, the area for decades and uh, they uh, are involved more so than our previous speakers in uh, a lot of uh, kind of storage and distribution. So. I think it'll be very interesting to hear from Scott about that. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Scott because you aren't here to listen to me talk. So take it away, Scott. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Oh, yeah, don't forget that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a neophyte at this. So if I mess up and things go haywire up there, forgive me. I got somebody that will help me up there in case I mess up. <laughs> Uh, I'm not used to PowerPoints and presentations, mostly uh, working on the farm is what I'm used to, but uh, I'll see how we do today. Um, yeah, as Chris said, um, I am Scott Deerdorf of Deerdorf Family Farms. We are a fourth generation farm here in Ventura County. We've been here in the county since the early 60s. Um, it was started, all right, let's see here. Uh, in 1910, my great-grandfather, W.H. Deerdorf, and I don't know what the W.H. stands for, he's always known to me as W.H., um, came out, well, started, a, worked for a distri distributor in Oklahoma. And so he got his uh, feet wet uh, distributing fresh fruits and vegetables in the Oklahoma state area. And then he eventually moved up the ladder at the company he was with and got in charge of uh, the California area. And so he decided to move to California with his son, William W. Deerdorf, and that's when they decided to set up their own business. And it was in the Alhambra, Pasadena area, and they specialized in representing growers in Kern County, Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego County, everything from tomatoes to potatoes, carrots, uh, lots of mixed vegetables. But they were, at that time, no farming, 100% just representing the grower and marketing their products to uh, people throughout the state. And here's a picture of the uh, two old guys. And then, in, like I said, in the early 60s, in 1962, uh, that's when my, my dad and my uncle got involved in the business. And they just saw the handwriting on the wall that really, to grow the business, we need to get, uh, get vertically integrated and start our own production, start our own growing. Um, and so uh, before we moved up here, though, kind of an interesting story that I always think about when I think about our, our family business and what it means to me. Um, when my, uh, my grandfather passed away, and then uh, not long after, unfortunately, my dad also passed away. But in those, during those two funerals, we had, um, especially when I was little and my grandfather passed away, a lot of um, Japanese Americans would come up to, my, to me and to my cousins and my brothers and they would bow and give us a dollar. And I got in the car afterwards and said, Dad, what, what's going on here? This is, I'm not, you, know, oh, just, you know, take the money, don't worry about it. Um, it's, they're, they're thanking you in a way or honoring your family for what they did during World War II. And what happened during World War II, uh, a lot of the ground that was farmed in the LA area, especially Venice, uh, West LA, like where, uh, um, UCLA is, and all those areas, those are actually used to be farm ground during World War II. And a lot of that ground was farmed by Japanese Americans. And well, what happened to them? They got interned, a lot of them went to Utah, they went out to the desert. And so that ground, uh, my grandfather and my, my great-grandfather farmed the ground while they were gone. And um, what was unique is when they came back to, to their ground, a lot of times they found that their ground was taken over. They didn't get it back. Um, our family obviously gave the ground back, and not only that, but we gave them the profits that we made. We shared in the profits that we made while they were interned. And so that for that, they were you know, eternally grateful. 
And so I always, you know, to me that's a part of a, a legacy of our farm and, as, and that's one of the reasons when we moved to Oxnard Ventura area, we moved because a lot of those farmers were now, they were building buildings and they were building schools and they were pushed off their ground and they sold their ground and they moved to Ventura County. So that's why you see a lot of uh, uh, Japanese Americans that farm in our county, especially strawberries and vegetables. Not so much in the tree crops, but if you go on the Oxnard Plains, a lot of the names of the landowners there are Yamamoto's, Aramora's, Hasegawa's. Those are the people that came here when their ground was developed in the western LA area. So that's what brought us here. We came with the Yamamoto family and they, they, they bought a bunch of ground, started farming, and we came up with them. And, uh, and then we also bought ground and started farming with them. But that's kind of a unique story for, for our company. And that's my dad there on the left, my Uncle Tom. Uh, and this is, these are old Oxnard photos when we moved up here and started growing strawberries and set up a sales. My dad was in charge of sales and my Uncle Tom ran the business and was in charge of basically administering the business. And then, let's see, then in, um, so now it brings us sort of to present day. Um, like I had two brothers. My, uh, my uncle had three boys, so there were six boys. We had no, no girls in the family in three generations. Um, my cousin Chris was the, had the first daughter, and then I followed after that. But um, of the six of us, Tom and I are, are the only owners left. My uncle's retired, and my brothers and his brothers decided not to get in the business and get involved. So we recapitalized, bought everyone out, made everyone happy, hopefully. And Tom and I are now the sole owners and operators of the business. So, and we are uh, sort of doing, throughout all these years, there's always been milestones, if you will, um, from representing just growers to uh, building facilities to do to, to, to cooling and shipping to getting into farming when we moved here in the 60s. And this year, or since Tom and I have taken over the company, we've um, started increased our organic products. We built a brand new facility in Oxnard, a state-of-the-art facility, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But sort of a new chapter, if you will, in, in Deardorff Family Farms. And that's Tom and I in a tomato field. I think that was in a newspaper a couple of years ago. So what are we known for? Um, we're, we're known for high quality vegetables. I, I think probably a lot of shippers could say that. But um, our family has always taken a very hands-on approach to running the business. So um, we've just become known at, for our quality. And Tom and I, and that's my grandfather up there, are always out in the field checking quality, working with our growers, working with our ranch managers, our harvest managers, working with our customers. Uh, we use a third-party service to grade our product every day. Um, and at one time, Deardorff, before it was Deardorff Family Farms, it was Deardorff Jackson Company. We were known, we had well over about 60% of the salary in the country was went through Deardorff Jackson Company. So we're, we've, we're known for our salary. And to this day, we're not nearly that percentage of the salary uh, in the country, but we still, it's, it's still our main crop here in Ventura County, in, in the wintertime especially. Uh, then we did, when we did move up here, we started growing strawberries and uh, have sort of a legacy in that, in that crop also. Did a lot of changes in that industry, but still by and large, we're known for our celery. And now, because of uh, what Tommy and I are doing, uh, becoming very well known in the organic world too. Sustainable business practices, yeah, we're also known for that. We've um, led the industry, like I said, on many fronts uh, for sustainable business practices. One of those that we do is we do medical outreach for all our employees. So we, we provide medical insurance for all of our employees, whether they're temporary, seasonal, full-time, part-time. Uh, we provide medical insurance to everybody that works at our company. And, uh, and, 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 and so doing that, one of the things we do for the field workers, the harvesting crews, and the people that are outdoors all the time is they usually don't have time to go in to uh, see a doctor or go to a clinic. So we partner up with some, uh, a local agency to bring the doctors and nurses out to the field. So they'll come out to the field, set up a table, uh, do uh, you know, blood pressure testing, uh, cholesterol testing, uh, insulin testing, uh, you know, sugar, all that kind of stuff. And you know, the, a lot of these guys work on piece rate and they're making 
on a good day, $20 an hour. On average, it's about $16 an hour. And to get them to come out of the field to do something like this, I thought it was going to be hard, but they, they, they stop in an instant. They want to stop working, take, take advantage of this free service. So we're usually pushing people back in the field, say, look, we want you, you guys, I know you want to make money. Let's, you guys can keep working. We'll pull out a couple at a time so you guys can work and do this at the same time. And it works out really well. Um, another thing, I almost pushed the wrong button here. Another thing we do, we just did, we just completed, like I said earlier, is this uh, LEED certified uh, facility. It's in Oxnard. It's 115,000 square feet. And it's LEED. It's not official yet. We're still in the paperwork uh, certification stage, but we have points, enough points to qualify for LEED gold. Um, and Chris and I were talking earlier about a year ago, we, I was here to get a plaque for that, for that facility, for our, for our project. It's a green building. It uses LED lighting. It's got state-of-the-art refrigeration equipment, so we save a ton of energy. Uh, it's got uh, native plants for the uh, vegetation and landscaping. Um, it's something we're very proud of, and it's also the latest food safety equipment and certifications too. And then another thing, part of our sustainability is organic farming. Uh, right now we're about 30% organic. Um, we've always practiced what we, we call around our office soft farming. So we would only use, you know, chemicals if you will or, or um, if, if we have to. Um, we use a lot of alternative methods if you will to control fertility and pest pressures. Um, so to switch over to organic farming, to get that brand, if you will, that's controlled by the government, wasn't a big step. The biggest hurdle, especially in Ventura County, is the ground. You have to go through a three-year certification process to get certified to be an organic grower. And um, the ground here is extremely expensive. Um, it's, it's, most people, when they come from other areas, and, and when I talk about the economics of growing here, they just shake their head. They have no idea how we can do it. And I've, even today, I heard some outlandish figures for rent that uh, some of these strawberry growers are, are getting or strawberry landowners are getting for next year. But uh, So to convert ground to organics is almost prohibitive unless you own the ground. You're not going to do it on lease ground. It just does not make sense at all. So luckily, we came here in the 60s. My great-grandfather and grandfather were smart enough to buy some ground. We own about 400 acres, not a lot, but you know enough to keep us control. Of, of the 1,500 acres we grow, we, we can control about a third of it. So of the 400 acres, we've, got, uh, we've converted uh, about 100, and we got another 100 coming online in, in December this year. It will be through its three-year process. So we'll be about half the ground we own will be organic. We also lease some organic ground up in the Piru area, and we also partner with some organic strawberry growers because you can't grow organic strawberries year after year on, on organic ground. It will deplete the ground. So they're always looking for vegetable growers to kind of trade ground with. So we've increased our acreage that way by taking some of their organic berry ground, use it for veggies for a year, then it goes back into our organic strawberries. So we farm about 600 acres of organic ground. So we're almost getting to the halfway mark of organic and conventional. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we've led the industry on a number of packaging and processing innovations uh, that kind of lead uh, dovetails into our uh, sustainable business practices. One of those is this this box here. This is a um, waterproof recyclable box. So a lot of the produce we grow, celery, lettuces, are, are cooled within a wet process. They go through a hydrovac here, which is a big stainless steel container, if you will, that holds 12 pallets. And doors are closed, it's pressure, it's vacuumed, the pressure is sucked out of it, and water is introduced to, to get that cooling, get that field heat out in about 30 minutes. So the industry for years has used wax boxes, heavily waxed boxes to, you know, otherwise a dry box would just fall apart. So uh, a couple of years ago we partnered with uh, International Paper, and this box is, I say it's plastic coated, it's got a film coating of some sort that, that degrades. And unlike a wax box, which basically has to be thrown in the trash when it gets to the supermarket, this box can go in the, you know, the, the big compactor and get recycled with all the 
you know, toilet paper boxes and any other, you know, dry boxes they have. So we, we, he had the exclusive on this for a couple of years and now it's pretty much out in the industry. It's more expensive, it's not really taking off because it does cost more. And like I said, with high rents and all the other economic issues in farming, the, we're, <laughs> we're talking, we're, we're counting pennies more than we're counting dollars. So although we still use a little bit of it, it it's expensive, but uh, we think it's worth it. So we're, we use it for most of our, our wet product, um, our commodities. Uh, again, this is a, a technology I talked about with the vacuum and uh, the, you can see the water jets spraying water on it. This, we were one of the first uh, companies to, to take this technology and use it for, for cooling celery. Like we say, back in the day we had 60-80% of the celery in the country. So this is not new technology, but at the time in the 60s it was new and we used a lot of it to cool um, celery and get away from using ice. And that was... Uh, much more sustainable, used a lot less resources, and provided a much better product. Um, and then this doesn't really illustrate it too well, but these uh, these are strawberry boxes, and for years strawberries were came in pints. You probably remember the little plastic pints you get at the grocery store. Well, those were packed in a box that was a, a non-standard size, and it went on to it didn't go on to a pallet. It went on to a skid, which is a 39-inch square kind of looked like a pallet, but it wasn't known as a pallet. It could not be reused. It was 39 inches square, no other commodity fit on it, no other dry good, nothing. It would get thrown away at the end of the day. So we would, the packaging was all meant to fit on this 39 inch square skid. So we redesigned the packaging to fit on a, a regular uh, GMA, Grocery Manufacturers Association of America, 40 by 48 inch pallet that holds everything from dry goods, cereals, you know, paper goods, and, and most produce, pro produce products except for strawberries. So we redesigned the package, uh, were the first ones to use it, and went to a recyclable, reusable hardwood pallet. And that didn't take long for the industry to switch over. I think within a year or two, that's the standard now in the strawberry industry. But I'm happy to say that we were the first ones to do it. And, we're, and we are not a big strawberry player. <laughs> We have never been a big strawberry player. It's kind of a niche market for us, but uh, we just saw the handwriting on the wall that, you know, this wasn't something that, you know, it needed a change, and we thought, you know, the only way to do it is if we go forward with it. And it didn't take long for the big Driscolls of the world to grab a hold of it and go. And they're, they're by far the biggest strawberry growers in the world. Um, another legacy of our company, if you will, is industry commitment and leadership. Um, I'm a past president of Ventura County Farm Bureau. Uh, I'm still on the board. I've been on the board for 115 or probably 18 years now. Um, my cousin Tommy is a past chairman of Western Growers Association. He follows his dad, who follows his dad. There's uh, when I went to his last meeting, the, um, the CEO said there has been a Deardorff on the Western Growers Board for over 40 years. So we've always been involved in leadership roles. I was one of the founding members of the Ag Futures Alliance Roundtable, which is a, 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 a collection of environmentalists, social, uh, you know, people that work in, on this roundtable, farmers, land use people, and we all uh, get together. Well, I'm not on anymore, but we used to get together once or once a month or once every other month to talk about issues in Ventura County. Um, I'm currently on the Agricultural Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, my cousin Tom was on the CDF, CDFA board. He's on the Farm Credit Board. My dad is past chairman of the Strawberry Commission. He, he was actually chairman two years in a row, or two uh, terms in a row, appointed by the governor. Um, so we've always, you know, part of our commitment to the industry is getting involved and being involved. So, um, where, where are we going? Where, where are our companies going now? Continue to develop uh, strategic partnerships with growers and shippers. Um, we are, our main growing area is here in Ventura County. We are, um, but part of being successful in this industry is having product year round. And we can't grow tomatoes here year round. We can't grow celery here year round. So we're developing partnerships with people in the Salinas area to grow. Uh, we have a partner up there that grows all of our organic vegetables in the summertime. And they're a family farm, a small family farm. And we just started production there actually Monday with cauliflower. 
So to, to keep that customer base in front of you uh, every day, you've got to have product every day. And uh, that's when you're our size, pretty small company, known to be seasonal, it's hard to do unless you develop relationships with growers in other parts of the, of the state. Uh, another thing we're bringing to market is um, a new variety of, uh, I think I have it up here, yeah. a, a new variety, value-added products, and a new variety, I'll just go right to the, all of them, uh, a new variety of tomato. We've, we've, uh, what's what we started, one of the things we started when we moved to California is representing tomato growers. And we've always grown vine-ripe, pole-grown tomatoes growing outdoors. And just like strawberries, but I think particularly in tomatoes, over the years they've been bred for long shelf life, for shipability, um, not so much for flavor. And I think that's really apparent in the people have a thing for tomatoes. I mean, strawberries are great, but people have a thing for that backyard tomato that's, that's long gone. Um, and we being a, a, a a premier, I would say, sort of a niche market tomato grower, always only growing vine-ripe tomatoes, not in a greenhouse, not grown green and then gassed to ripen. Ours ripen on the vine naturally, and uh, there we're one of the two or three left in the in the state that grow vine-ripe tomatoes. But it was still, even though it was better than, in my opinion, a, a, a greenhouse tomato, it didn't look as good, but it tasted better, it has more uh, body to it. Uh, has more meat on it, if you will. Um, it still didn't taste as good as they do 20, 30 years ago. So there's a guy in Florida who developed through uh, natural crossbreeding techniques a new tomato called a Tasty Lee. And it took the East Coast by storm about four or five years ago. And we got the exclusive to grow that and distribute it here uh, in the western U.S. So we have everything from the Rockies to this, this side of the Rockies. And we, this year was our first year growing it. We grew about 50 acres of it. Um, it grows a little bit different than other tomatoes. We kind of, you know, got off to a rocky start. But uh, by the end of it, we figured out how to grow it, how to package it. And it really does live up to its name of, uh, you know, they call it the backyard tomato. It really does have a lot better flavor than anything we've ever grown. So we're really excited about that. But it, going back to having that year-round product availability. Well, we can't grow tomatoes here. We don't have a greenhouse. I mean, some, you can grow tomatoes here year-round if you have a protected harvest uh, you know, situation, usually greenhouses, or you see those hoops that some of the raspberry growers use. So what we've done is partnered with some growers in southern uh, Baja in La Paz area, a very small family organic grower, and another one in Cuyacan who grows another, has another small organic farm there. And we've had relationships with some of these families for years. We used to do a lot of tomato imports years ago. We got out of it. We kind of reestablished those relationships with this Tasty Lee. And we've had uh, good success. They've, uh, they, like us, their first year growing it, they had a little uh, learning curve to get up to. But uh, so far, by the end of both those seasons, they've kind of learned how to grow this tomato differently than than how they've been growing tomatoes in the past 20 years. So it's a different way of harvesting it, a different way of uh, giving it the plant the proper nutrition to get that flavor. So we're going to be back in production here in probably July, and it usually goes to the you know some of the higher end markets like uh, Whole Foods, Sprouts, Ralph's is going to start picking it up, um, fries. So it's going to be out in the marketplace a lot more this year than it was last year. So we're excited about that. But that's part of our where we're going is identifying those products that have get back to flavor, get back to what we, you know, the consumer wants. And tomatoes for to me and for my cousin and I was a good place to start. We know the crop. We know people want a good tasting tomato. So we're kind of taking a leap of faith and, and jumped on ba on the bandwagon for the Tasty Lee variety. And it's it's got a different kind of packaging. It's a flow wrap kind of European packaging, so it sets itself off on the shelf. There's a lot of different things about it. So we're hoping that's going to help out a lot because we can't compete with the greenhouses anymore. <laughs> There's just no way we can pump out the amount of fruit they pump out. And so we got to set ourselves apart. Um, so that's kind of part of developing uh, uh, value-added or consumer packaging um, that, like I say, comes in its own unique packaging. 
and getting that brand in front of a consumer. Which brings us to consumer awareness of our brand. That, that is a shelf ready package. So it will be on the shelf with our name on it, just like strawberries are. A lot of things you see grown in this county you don't see on the shelf or you, you, don't, you don't see the brand on the shelf except for strawberries. You see celery, lettuce, and all that, but it doesn't have any brand name on it. It can be grown anywhere. It can be grown in Mexico for, for, for all that's worth. And, uh, but we're, we're trying to get back into putting our brand name in front of the consumer so they can make that choice. So they know that it comes from uh, not only the U.S., but it comes from Ventura County, and they know, you know, try to tell our story, which really is what the organics have given us that opportunity to do. So challenges to getting there. Um, that There's a lot of them. Uh, I'll, uh, one of them is labor. Um, uh, we've gone through ebbs and flows of labor uh, as far as availability to, to, to grow and, and harvest our crops. Right now, we're at a, a place where we can't get strawberries picked. Um, to, labor is extremely tight right now. Um, we've got uh, we, we've we've stopped our fresh market uh, harvesting for the most part. We're now uh, harvesting for the processor, but the season, the strawberry season this year was very bad marketing wise. The prices were depressed. Too many a lot of fruit came out of Mexico. They increased their production by 4,000 acres, which just is mind-boggling. I don't know how they did it. And uh, Florida had a good production year. So the, mar the, the market for strawberries this winter was worse than it's been in years. On top of that, we have a labor shortage. Um, and the growers are really feeling it right now. They can't get enough labor to pick that processing crop. A lot of the people would like to move up to Santa Maria, then on to Watsonville where there's new fresh product. It's easier to pick. They can make more money. So um, I think the processing crop is going to be cut short too just because there's not enough people out there to, to, to harvest the crop. Um, on the veggie side, uh, we're just on the razor's edge. We just we barely have enough people to, to harvest what we have out there. And it's not going to get any better. So I know there's, I think just today, actually, the Senate uh, released a, a comprehensive labor uh, immigration policy. Um, it's out there. I haven't really looked at it. I, I know some of the things that went into it. I don't know what it, who knows? It's like anything, any law it goes in, it comes out different. I don't know how it's coming out. Um, but I know uh, there are some provisions there that will help uh, with the agricultural labor, um, and there are, provisions for a, citizen, a pathway to citizenship, if you will, for the labor that's here or the labor that works in agriculture. Um, it's like Tom Nassif from Western Growers said, you know, our fresh produce is going to be picked by foreigners. The question is, do we want it grown and harvested here or in the actual country where these foreigners are? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously biased, but I think having a, a national uh, food uh, industry is important to our security for a lot of reasons. So I'd rather it grown here under our socially accountable laws, under our environmental laws. Uh, you know, it's better for us, better for the world if, if, if it's grown under the same circumstances, if you will, which we all know that, you know, uh, a lot of our fruits and vegetables, strawberries, lettuce, are grown in Mexico. And I know a lot of my friends in the ag industry who have gone on to start farms down there or increase their production down there because it is far less expensive down there, not only labor-wise, but environmental-wise, regulatory-wise. They're setting up brand-new state-of-the-art coolers, brand-new state-of-the-art distribution centers because it is so much less expensive down there. So it's harder and harder, and, and ground is next to nothing compared to what we pay here. So the economics are just, you know, we're always challenging ourselves to get more efficient, do more with less, and it's, you know, we, we have to do it, otherwise we wouldn't survive. But it's getting harder and harder. And labor is one of the things pushing a lot of the production down there, along with land. Like I said, land, I heard today that some strawberry acreage is going for rent for $5,000 an acre. I mean... The first ranch we bought, I think we paid that much for it in the 60s. And now people are getting that much rent for it. That's, uh, I, 
I just don't see how that pencils out, but <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. We, we, our company doesn't pay that much for ground. Uh, veggie ground is sort of seen as a second tier ground. It doesn't command that much rent, but when you've got an increase in strawberry acreage and strawberry growers uh, pushing land rent that high, it affects everybody across the board. So we, I, I see our land rent going up too. Um, but five thousand, I you know, I, I when I started uh, in 1985, I mean, two thousand dollars an acre was in incomprehensible. <laughs> so now that it's five thousand dollars an acre, it's it's amazing. And uh, not only that, but uh, so that's one factor of land is just the cost. Uh, the other is just availability. I mean, it's just there's not as much farm ground available here as there used to be, um, and that's because of development, no doubt. Um, and for the most part, that development has been along sort of corridors, freeway corridors, and things like that. But uh, you know, being on the Ag Policy Advisory Committee and the Farm Bureau, you know, part of our part of our mission, if you will, is to preserve that agricultural uh, ground in Ventura County as long as we can. But another a flip side of that is people, businesses like our business, depend on that value of ground to capitalize our business. If that ground was still worth $5,000 an acre, I wouldn't have been able to build a $15 million facility. I wouldn't be able to add acreage or, or finance my growing. So it's, it's kind of a double-sided coin, if you will. I mean, we, we don't want to um, take away too many um, landowner rights, if you will, that, that diminish the value of ground because uh, we need that capital availability to leverage our business and continue to grow. So it's, it's a delicate line between, you know, how much we curtail uh, development on ag ground and how much we just let it go. So um, I, to me, I, I just look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis and, and uh, you know, if, 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 if somebody here can sell their ground for a certain amount and then go to Santa Maria or Salinas and double their acreage, you know, that's, that's an ec a, a, a company economic issue, not so much a county economic issue. So that's why you see farmers are on both sides of the fence sometimes on that, that issue. It really is a big gorilla in the room. When you go to Farm Bureau meetings or Ag Association meetings, you have landowning farmers and you have tenant farmers. And it's a big gorilla always in the, issue, in the room is land use and how, what's the best way to regulate that, you know? So it, it's a tough one. It's really a tough one. Water, well, it's another, especially in Southern California, a huge part. You can't grow without water. And water is, uh, this year, you know, you have, you have dry years, you have wet years. Um, problem is, in the wet years, we don't have a lot of storage. You know, we haven't built dams or any way to store water in years and years and years and tens of decades. So that storage is, is finite. It's been fixed for years. And the, the, because of economics, the crop matrix, if you will, in Ventura County has changed. Uh, it used to be lots of dry beans, uh, tree farms. Didn't use a lot of water. Didn't, have, didn't need a lot of water. Now we have strawberries, celery, vegetables, very high value, high pro production commodities, greenhouses. Greenhouses use a ton of water. It's a huge amount of water that those that greenhouses use for their production. Um, but that's be those crops have come because of the economics, and so it's really taxing that water system. And this year, I know Piru is way down, and there's going to not going to be much of a release this year. So. Water is going to be a big issue come this fall. Uh, when strawberries go in the ground and they start you know, watering and sprinkling strawberries, it's going to be a big issue. And water quality for that matter too. Healthcare reform, Chris and I were just talking about this. Um, that's just, uh, you, know, that's, you know, like I say, we, we provide health insurance to all of our employees. They're not all $10 deductible, HMO, you know, unlimited benefit plans. You know, there's no, you know, we can't afford that for everyone that works here seasonal or part-time. Uh, the, you know, 
Obamacare or health care reform is a different uh, health plan than, we're, than we provide our employees. Uh, I went to a seminar yesterday. Uh, they estimate it's going to cost about $4,000 a year per employee for health insurance. And that's at the minimum level, the bronze level, they call it, for health, health insurance for, um, for an employee. Um, agriculture, as you probably know, is just a different industry. We're not in a, in a factory or in a, in a high-rise building. We don't have, we have seasonal workers, we have temporary workers. Uh, so this is going to be a big cost burden, if you will, on the average farm in Ventura County, especially with all the other economics that affect it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, the costs haven't been really laid out yet, especially in the ag industry, but they're going to be substantial. And it's just another thing that we're going to have to to learn to deal with that our neighbors, you know, 300 miles on the other side of the border have, you know, absolutely no concern whatsoever. They don't have to deal with it at all. So just another thing pushing, it's like anything, you know, we don't make anything in this country anymore. It's all being pushed somewhere else because of economic issues. And this is one that will affect probably farming and agriculture more than most other industries. But I'm sure it's going to affect everybody. But being that uh, uh, we're going to have to deal with it and the growers on the other side of the border aren't going to have to, it's just going to be a huge burden for us. Um, food safety is a big issue that started in 96 with the spinach uh, catastrophe, if you will. Uh, the federal government's now getting involved. They just released the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, we, growing leafy greens, we're already pretty much doing 99.9% .9 of that act anyway. Leafy greens took the downfall, uh, or took the spotlight, I should say, when the spinach scare or spinach catastrophe happened. And the industry took the uh, bull by the horn, so to speak, and started their own what's called the Leafy Green Marketing Association, which is uh, basically a food safety uh, act or a food safety uh, uh, organization. And to get that certification, you have to abide by all their food safety rules. So for us in, 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 uh, in Ventura County that grow leafy greens, celery, or lettuces, we already are doing 99% of this. But it's, it's another cost that's going to be put on other commodities that, that don't have to deal with the stuff we have to in the leafy green industry. The strawberry industry is going to have to step up their game, uh, the citrus industry. And even though there's a lot different uh, risk, if you will, in leafy greens or tomatoes than there is in oranges and lemons or bananas, things you peel, things that it's just totally different risk profile there, but they're going to all have to come up to live by the same rules we have to, so that's going to increase their costs tremendously. Air Resources can, uh, Board regulations. Uh, this is something we've been dealing with for a while now, um, especially as it pertains to diesel engines. Um, a lot of our wells use diesel engines. A lot of our trucks that haul produce in from the field use diesel engines. And um, yeah, and like like most farms, we have trucks that are you know 30, 40 years old. I mean, they don't they don't put a lot of miles on them. They go 10 miles, a, you know, there and back, five miles there and back. So they're doing that. At the end of the year, they'll be lucky to put in 10 or 15 thousand miles on a truck. So it can be 30 years old and it's still fine. But when they change the uh, emission standards and we can no longer use that truck, we have to we have to mothball it, or you know you can't even re retrofit some of the older stuff. We do have some exemptions, but that's just a certain amount of miles. And that amount of miles is getting lower every year. So basically, it's going to render some of our fleet obsolete. We're not going to be able to sell it, because who's going to buy it? Doesn't, you know, we can, no one will buy it. So it's basically worthless. So that's just another cost of replacing some of the older vehicles, older trucks, with newer ones. International trade is big. Like I say, um, especially in the tomato industry just recently, uh, Mexico was accused of dumping tomatoes in uh, in the U.S., and uh, so they have to. We we're re renegotiating our trade with Mexico for tomatoes, um, so that they don't undercut the American producers. Uh, but it's like any negotiation, or especially in international trade, what what, what you win on one side, you lose somewhere else. So. Um, 
that's going to be a big issue for us going forward. We, we export a lot of tomatoes to Japan, and uh, there's always different sets of rules, different, different growing rules even. So all these international trade agreements, the, the, it's in the details. I mean, the devil's in the details of what's in those agreements as far as how and where we can export or import produce. And for us to move forward and be a year-round supplier on some of the commodities we grow, we have no alternative but to uh, seek partners and in, in strategic partners in like Mexico to grow some of the like tomatoes, especially during the off season, our off season. Invasive pests, not so much a, a, an issue for us, but I'm sure you've heard of the Asian citrus psyllid that's wreaking havoc in Florida. It's all over Ventura County, Riverside County, LA County, it's in Santa Barbara County. It's not so much the pest that's hurting the crop, it's the disease they carry with them. So that's a, and, and with the budget cuts and whatnot, that those those programs to, you know, you probably remember back in the, what was it, the 80s when we had the medfly scare and there was pretty good re eradication efforts that went on. We got rid of the medfly. Well, that's not going to, those type of efforts are not going to happen anymore. Um, it's much more uh, spot treatment and relying on growers to um, treat the pests in their orchards and um, voluntarily and if not voluntarily uh, lately. I know Henry's had to get some um, some warrants from, from the court mandating some, some growers treat their orchards for this pest. So that's going to continue to grow. Um, they're, 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 there's more, more and more ways for these pests to get into our country and less and less stops at the borders to prevent it because of budget cuts and whatnot. So that's kind of our story. Um, these are some of our labels. That's our strawberry label that you'll see. Uh, I saw it in Walmart not too long ago. That's our organic label. Uh, you'll see that at Whole Foods. Uh, Lassen uh, Natural Foods buys from us directly. Sir William is our major uh, brand for, uh, for celery and vegetables. Um, so with that, I mean, if there's any questions or any comments, I, I kind of talk fast and I, I lose my, <laughs> I got to stop once in a while to take a breath, but. Uh, Yeah, we grow on 1,500 acres, of which about 400 acres is organic. We'll, our volume, we'll probably push through our cooling facility, oh, 10 million packages between strawberries, tomatoes, celery, lettuce, collards, kales, chards, parsleys. Um, yeah, and we do some outside cooling for other, other growers too. So we'll put 10 million packages through our cooler pretty easily. So, you know, that's, we're about a, uh, we're 25 to $30 million company, revenue-wise. Yeah. Tasty Lee. Uh, T-A-S-T-I, there's no E, dash L-E-E, -E, Tasty Lee. He named it after, yeah, I think it's his mother-in-law. <laughs> so... <laughs> But it's got its, uh, you know, part of, you know, the big part of it is the tomato, and then they've also patented the seed, and then they've got a marketing branch behind it with their own uh, brand, Tasty Lee. You'll find on the bottom of the package, it'll say grown by Deirdre Family Farms with our logo on it. You know, if we grew it, if it came from Florida, it'll have a different grower or whatever, but Tasty Lee is the brand name. Yeah. We'll, we'll, our production will come on in July. Uh, Whole Foods the, is going to open, I think, in, in June here. Uh, they're actually going to feature us as one of the uh, local growers. I'm working with them on marketing materials and things like that. So they'll be carrying the Tasty Lee here. Um, Sprouts down in the valley, I know they have it. And then Ralph's is, that's one of the things we, it's new to us, is working directly with retailers. We usually work through distributors and wholesalers. Um, and it's a totally different animal working with directly with retailers. They want year-round supply. They want uh, the product on demand, ready to put on the shelf when they want it. You know, <laughs> usually those are the things we rely on wholesalers, distributors to do. So for us as a grower to work directly with a retailer is quite challenging. And they, you know, they're used to putting the coke on the on the shelf, the crackers, you know, 
And if it doesn't work, they call you up and say, I'm sending three packages back. It's like, okay, well, what do you want me to do with it? <laughs> so it's just a totally different animal, and, and this Tasty Lee is really uh, challenging us. But we're, we finally got Ralph's on board, and they're going to come on next year. So they'll be in more stores. Yeah. We sell a lot of product to Canada because uh, our primary vegetable growing season is in the wintertime. So we send it to, we have big uh, distributors in New York uh, and we have it on the, in British Columbia on the western uh, Canada. And um, we have one in Indianapolis. So we're, we're, we're countrywide. We, we ship everywhere. Right. You can do whatever you want. You can leave it fallow, um, but that won't pay any bills. Uh, you, what you're required to do is either leave it fallow or grow anything you grow on. It has to be grown organically. So it, it goes into we put it in. We 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 involve our certifier at that time when we identify some ground we want to convert to organics, and they start monitoring it for us. And then we just grow it as if it's an organic piece of ground. Problem is we can't sell it as organically. We can't put that brand name now on it. We can't call it organic. We can't put our organic label on it. We can't put the USDA label on it. We have to put it in a conventional box. And in organics, in the crops we grow, um, it's we get we can easily get the same produ production. On a, on a field if everything goes right. The problem is not all the time does everything grow right. So we will either get 100% production or we'll lose the whole field. So at the end of the day, we're probably losing 20 to 30% of our production in organics. Um, there are just things like blight that will, once they get into a field, in an organic field, you cannot control it. You'll just, you'll have to walk away. It'll literally burn up the field in a weekend. Big pest right now, which I didn't talk about, that's hitting Ventura County. It's working its way northward, um, and it's, it came from South Africa. Is the Bagrata bug? It's a little black beetle. You'll probably see it in your yard in the summertime. I saw it in my yard. It's a little black beetle with little white spots on it, and it is a voracious eater. Anything in the brassica family, broccoli, collards, kales. I mean, it just. I've got some, I should have brought in some pictures of, we'll have chards right next to kales and, and collards that are just decimated, the chard they won't even touch. And you know, people say, what do they look like? I tell them what they look like, and they always come in pairs. They mate 24-7. I mean, they are exploding right now. And there's nothing in the organic world to control them. So we have to change our, our planting practices. When we plant, they're definitely more populations are huge in the summertime, not so much in the wintertime. But that's just going crazy. And even in the conventional world, it's very hard to control. So that's a pest that, uh, you know, we have to monitor with crop rotations and things like that to keep it at bay as much as we can. Yeah? We sell them here. We, the only thing we grow in Mexico is that Tasty Lee tomato. And we bring them up here in bulk, and then we regrade them and put them in the Tasty Lee packaging and, and sell them out of our warehouse here in Oxnard. So we, 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 we go through a whole regrading process, make sure it's up to Tasty Lee standards before we ship it out. Yeah. Um, the, the problem with the greenhouse now is they've kind of shot themselves in the foot. Uh, there's a huge greenhouse called Eurofresh in Arizona that recently declared bankruptcy. And 10, 15 years ago, uh, when tomatoes were two, three dollars a pound, the economics penciled out, and they could grow tomatoes 24/7, 365, set up. And they have a, a, an ability that's hard for us. They can work with the retailer. They're, they're just a factory. They're pushing out tomatoes every day, very calculated what their production is every day. And they can set up 
year-round uh, agreements with retailers and get that perfect tomato on the shelf every day. We can't. Uh, but recently, the tomato market is not, it's not $2, $3 a pound anymore. It's 99 cents a pound. So that economics is not working out so much for the, at least definitely didn't work out for Eurofresh in, in uh, Arizona. Uh, Hallings has done a great job of keeping those relationships with retailers directly, and I think they'll be able to keep their economics going. But um, it's a huge capital investment, huge capital investment that uh, a company our size, without uh, you know investment partners or uh, you know, it, it's not something we would be able to do very easily. Uh, you see some of the, the protected you know raspberry uh, hoop structures I call them. Um, things like that we could probably do with um, tomatoes, but it would just it would just be to get the shoulder seasons to kind of extend our seasons or start a little early. It wouldn't give us year-round production, and it, and it's also a huge user of water. It's um, I think the county they've got 120 acres there in in, in Howling, and uh, they're using a lot more water than I think anyone knew, and so there's no way that you know that kind of we could sustain you know a lot of acreage of greenhouse agricultural production without another source of water, you know, desal or something, because it's, it's, uh, they use a lot of water. But, you know, they can pay a little bit more because their production's quite high. So I, I don't see us moving to that, no. No. Thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's not used to that. Very natural. <laughs> no, no, it was very good. <laughs>